Princeton in his 1896 commemorative address at Princeton University expressed these sentiments. What you cannot find a substitute for is the classics as literature. Your enlightenment depends upon the company you keep. You do not know the world until you know the men who have possessed it and tried its ways before ever you were given your brief run upon it. And there is no sanity comparable with that which is schooled in the thoughts that will keep. At a conference I attended in Glasgow two weeks ago, Tam Diel, a retired Scottish Labour politician, praised the study of antiquity for the quality of mind it instills in all who study it. He drew numerous examples from his experience um, over 35 years in the British Parliament um, with his classically trained colleagues. What do these two men, one writing and speaking in 1896 and the other in 2009, what do they mean when they say that we have something to learn from classics, from antiquity? Nowadays, we usually express such sentiments in the language of utility or transferable skills that somehow contact with the ancient world, reading the great works of Plato, Aristotle, Thucydides, Demosthenes, Cicero, teach us something we can learn nowhere else. What lessons does antiquity have to teach us? We've heard some answers here this morning. Things about analogies that we can draw from historical, political, cultural, philosophical texts. We've talked about role models, characteristics that um, we would like Obama to emulate. But I want to approach this all from a slightly different perspective. In doing so, I turn to a little studied dialogue of Plato, a very short one called the Hippias Minor. It's considered alongside the Apology, the Crito, the Euthyphro, among others, to be one of the earlier dialogues. Like them, it ends in aporia, a state of perplexity. Only this time it is Socrates himself who is perplexed when he comes to the end of his own argument and finds that he has argued that the intentional teller of lies is a better man than the one who tells falsehoods involuntarily. We will not get into the philosophical details of the Hippias Minor today, but I do want to look at the point at which uh, Socrates departs on this um, long uh, discussion. And it starts with the question to Hippias, which Homeric hero is the best, Odysseus or Achilles? I highly recommend this is an essay topic for undergraduates. They really like to talk about this. His interlocutor in this dialogue is 